Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Hope everyone had a great week. And we've come today to worship the Lord. Just going to move that a little that way. So today's sermon is to be known. But before we begin, what's the most important person to have here today? The Holy Spirit. So let's bow our heads and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts. We come to you, Lord, as your people. We seek guidance and wisdom, Lord. We ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That, Lord, the words I speak are not my own. That they might be yours and yours alone. And the message that's said, Lord, might be heard by everyone as they need to hear in your will. That, Lord, we all might draw closer to you. That we might come to you, Lord, with humble hearts. And that, Lord, we might be known by you. Because, Lord, that is truly the only knowing that matters. We pray this to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so I have to say, would everyone agree that everyone is known for something? And you think about it, go, wait a minute, really? Ask a teacher in class. Doesn't she have a room full of kids? Some are attentive, some are mischievous, some are jokers. But they're all known for something, right? Now even like, take us. We're all known for something, whether we know it or not. People look at us, people evaluate us, right? And we are known in one way or another. So let's even look around us here. What's the motto for the church? No, nobody knows. <laughs> to know Jesus and to make him known. Right? Hopefully, we can be known by others as well for that. But what does it mean? We'll cover that towards the end of the sermon. So let me ask you, uh, do people in this world want to be known? Fame, acknowledgement for achievements, or just being famous for the desire of being famous? I think of Paris Hilton on that one. You have actors, athletes in basketball, football, hockey, etc., all wanting to be known, to be the greatest, the smartest at whatever they pursue. Even the guy who purposely burned down the temple of Artemis hoped to be immortalized by his name. That was the night when Alexander the Great was born. Does anyone remember? His name was Herostratus. Yes, I had to look it up myself, and we'll all forget in 10 minutes. And that's okay. But don't worry, because the point is, in the world, people want to be known for that acknowledgement, that affirmation. But let's look at the definition of what known is. Oxford Languages says, to known is actually the past participle of to know. And to know is be aware of through observation, inquiry, or information. Basically, to know facts, right? The second definition is what we're more interested in, having have developed a relationship with someone through meeting and spending time with them, be familiar or friendly with, to know a person. We're going to focus on number two. There is being known in the world and having them be familiar or friendly with you, but there is another known, being known by God. It doesn't involve worldly praise or exaltation. There is no admiration from the general populace. It involves dedication, sacrifice, faith, and perseverance to the extreme. The requirements are being hated by the world and ostracized by the status quo. With a hefty dose of trials and tribulations. Do you want to be known like that? A lot of people don't. But I forgot one thing. There is the retirement package. And the retirement package consists of eternal bliss in the presence of God, the Father and the Lamb, permanent good health, the ability to study the mysteries of the universe and creation, building your own home and traveling throughout the universe. Now, are you interested? We are going to look into God's word today and see what it means to be known. I can give you my opinion, but who am I? 
Let's go to the source and authority. And also what the consequences of not being known can be. And we're going to start with the scripture that is probably familiar to us all. You all know the ten virgins? The parable of the ten virgins? Okay, so we're going to read Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, not or they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered and said, there, there, no, there will be not enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So we see the ten virgins, right? They're all pure and undefiled. They're virgins. They all go to church. On the surface, they all appear to be disciples of Jesus. And we learned early that the foolish ones did not bring extra oil. We'll touch on that in a bit. But initially, all ten arrive, and they have their lamps burning bright. Can you picture them? All ten of them, dressed in white, carrying their lamps, and going on the procession. It looks pretty good, right? We don't notice if they have an extra flask of oil or not. We just see the procession of all of them coming to meet the bridegroom. And they are looking good. And the bridegroom is late. Let me ask you, is God's timing our timing? Hardly ever. I want to read 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all those to come to repentance. God's timing is in our timing, but God knows what he's doing. Our part is to trust him for who he is and that he does know. We look at Matthew 24, 3, when the disciples ask Jesus, and when will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And what would happen if Jesus said to them, no, you have to wait at least 2,000 years, at least, and then I'm going to come. Can you see the momentum draining? And really, you look at it, isn't the time when we fall asleep the time that is just around the corner anyway? Because the next thing we'll know is we'll see Christ in the clouds. So the bridegroom comes, and all ten virgins are sleeping. They are all surprised at his arrival especially in the dead of night at midnight. So as they trim their lamps for a better flame for light, they realize that their lamps are nearly going out for all ten of them. They need more oil to sustain the light of their lamps, to see the path to the bridegroom, Jesus. Without that oil, they are unable to safely reach him, lest they stumble in the darkness at that midnight hour. Can the five wise virgins give the foolish ones their oil? They can't. And why? Because it's not theirs to give. It was given to each one of them only, nobody else. The scripture only says that the foolish virgins went to buy oil and they later came to meet the bridegroom. I don't believe they purchased any more oil because the oil distributor had already closed up shop. You cannot buy the Holy Spirit, that oil. Simon the magician found that one out the hard way in Acts 8, 19 and 20. He said to Peter, 
saying, give, us, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. That Holy Spirit is a gift of God. Let's make sure we understand that. You cannot buy it. You cannot earn it. And once those doors shut, that means probation is closed. There is no more forgiveness for sins, no more repentance, no more grace. Revelations 22.11 says, Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And even though they cry to the Lord, open up for us, Jesus replies, truly I say to you, I do not know you. The SDA Bible commentary says their lack of foresight was inexcusable and their loss irretrievable. And then the reality of the final judgment sinks in. I'm certain in, the, in that day, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for the five foolish virgins. But why did Jesus not know them? And what is the difference between the wise and the foolish virgins? The oil? The gift from God? Why does one group have more oil, really the Holy Spirit, than the other? How did they get that oil? So that they would be known to Christ. For the short answer, we can look at the SDA Bible commentary, and it says, for verse 3, oil. This symbolizes the Holy Spirit, it has the biblical references, of which the church members here represented are destitute. Those are the five foolish ones. They're familiar with the theory of the truth, but the gospel has affected no change in their lives. Whereas in verse 4, the wise, the wise virgins of the parable represent those Christians who understand, appreciate, and avail themselves in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Wise indeed are Christians today who welcome the Holy Spirit into their lives and cooperate with him in his appointed task. Simply put, you listen to the impressions and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. To do God's good pleasure on this earth. You're a co-laborer. You get the only job that's offered to us and us alone. And that is to participate with Christ. And not only saving yourself, but to spread the news to others and to do his will and pleasure. Nobody else in the universe can say that. We are offered that exclusively. So... Why is it that they had the extra oil? It's a gift from God to them, non-transferable to another party or person. We have the short answer, and we could probably work some of that into our lives, but why do those wise virgins have so much more oil than the foolish ones, enough to meet the very tardy bridegroom? We see in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, it says, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you think that love could play a, a role in being known to God? Joe, or John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What are the commandments? And we know the Ten Commandments, but what do they really represent? The character of God. So if you love him, you'll be in the same thoughts as God and in the same agreement. And we know that the, the Decalogue is reflected in that way. In 1 Corinthians 8, 2, and 3, it says, If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. And that is the human knowledge that we so value in this world. Because it says, if anyone loves God, he is known by him. And that, my friends, is priceless. 
So I could know the mysteries of this world, be a pinnacle among men, admired and esteemed. I could know, or I could be known to the world and exalted, but would I be known by the Lord? No. We need to know that love. And the word love there in all those scriptures is agape, the agape love. To abide in it and to let it shine through us to others. This is a love beyond our comprehension. This isn't the love you have for your spouse. It's not the love I even have for myself or ourselves. And the love that one has for their children is probably the closest thing that human beings can relate to. If you ask Enoch, after 65 years when Methuselah was born, right? It changed his life, and he walked with God for 300 more years, and God took him to heaven, because at least that was his gateway to understand what agape love truly is. We can only have that love if God gives it to us, if we have his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So we need to have the proper dwelling place for that agape love to dwell and thrive in us so that what is it that makes our bodies, our temples, a suitable dwelling place? So let me ask you, we've all worked in the office a lot. Have you ever heard of the seven habits of highly effective people? Or as we used to jokingly say in the office, the seven habits of highly defective people? <laughs> because some people take it to extreme, right? Well, I'm going to propose that we have the seven habits of people known by God. Habits that they possess, things that they do. And number one would be they spend time with God. So you may ask, how much time do you need to spend? Well, obviously you're here on Sabbath, right? You've already got a running start. So... You know, you and the people watching, they realize the Sabbath is a special blessed day. Spending an hour or two a day in some activity with God would be extremely beneficial as well. If you have a start and end your day with God, that would be icing on the cake now, wouldn't it? The first habit of people who are known by God is spending time with him. So let me ask you, if you have a spouse or a significant other, you spend time with them, right? What if you only spent from Friday night to Saturday night with them? And even during that time, you just talked to them here and there. How well would you know your spouse? Not so much, right? But you wouldn't even interact that much. I have been married for almost 17 years. I know my wife's habits, her idiosyncrasies how she will react in a situation almost like clockwork. Why? Because I've spent almost every day with her in my life. I know her. Do we know God like that, though? Do we spend time with him? If I don't make my time for my wife, I'm shooting my marriage in the foot. If we don't make time for God, we're damaging our relationship with him. The one that we truly need to know, even above my wife, sorry, honey, but it's true, because she can't save me. There's only one person that can take me to heaven, and that's Jesus. We read in, um, in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9, when Moses is speaking to him, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on your doorpost and on the house of your house and on your gates. Israel was, or was to keep all that God had instructed them, talking about it pretty much all of the waking hours. Bind it to your hand. In other words, in all that you do, God should be involved to the frontals of your forehead and all that you think about. They, they keep God's ways and character involved in all that they do. We have this actually in the New Testament too. Have you heard the phrase pray without ceasing? It's the same concept. 
It sounds like an Enoch level almost time of spending, right? Where it's 24-7. But God just wants you to keep him in your thoughts. You don't seriously stay, sit there and pray 24 hours a day. But you consider what God considers right and wrong in all that you do. And uh, it's well, something for all of us. How we spend our time. Do I watch TV? Am I busy entertaining myself? Do I work too much? Do I set aside time for God? Do I make time for a lot of other things? So the second step of people who are known by God is to spend time in God's word. They read the Bible. I used the example of my wife earlier. One of the ways I know about her is conversing with her. We talk, right? One of the God's ways that God speaks to us is through his word. His word is active and living, not just words on a page, life-changing words to those that read them. We have 1 Peter 1.23. For you have been born again, not, out of, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. In Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You mean the word of God can convict me? I hope so. And even before, when it changes you, the word of God is transforming? It most certainly is. If there ever was a manual for life in a sin-stricken world, it's the Bible. It covers about every situation one could think of. It has wisdom superior to anything human beings can come up with. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are but few to find it. While the world is heading towards a wide and easy gate, the Bible is the roadmap and navigation to the narrow gate that leads to life. I can tell you about, I will tell you about God's character from the joy of creation the, to the fall of man, to the plan of salvation, to the sacrifice on the cross, and the everlasting kingdom to come that will never have an end. All about the love, that agape love that God has for us. I mean, we can't even fathom what God has done for us to save us from ourselves. It baffles me just completely to think why he would save me. But he loves all of us. But he loves us all so much. That is his desire to spend eternity with every one of us, all of you. It just... The Bible is spiritual food for a living soul. And always remember to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit before reading so that we don't put our own understanding on God's word or God's love letter, as some has called, have come to call it. Which leads me to number three. That people, the third thing that people who are known by God do, they spend time in prayer to the Lord. They talk to God in prayer and lay their burdens on him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you that peace. We think of peace as the absence of violence, right? This peace as the peace that is the inner peace. This is the peace that Paul and Silas have while they're singing hymns in the prison after being beaten in Philippi. This is the peace that Stephen has as he looks to heaven as they're preparing to stone him. It's something that we cannot have on our own, but God, is once again, is a gift from God to us. And we have that by praying. We learn his will and his character to show in, in, in our lives First, there's the new self, right? In Ephesians 4, 24. 
and put on the new self, which is, uh, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So when we come to God, he creates that new man in us. And we pray and petition that God's will be done. John, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is a confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we will have the request which we have asked from him. We had a testimony about the um, prayer group the other day. Armand did. Oh, no, actually, Cindy did. And there's a lot of things that, that God has just answered. As you learn to pray his will, and he answers incredible prayers. We see people cured of cancer that have like 40 tumors in her stomach. Incredible things that God does. We pray to intercede for others, believing believers and non-believers. Even in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul asked for the church to pray for him, that he may speak boldly for God. Prayer helps build the body of Christ in one accord in Jesus. And we look at Acts 1.14. These all were of one mind continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They are all of one accord in Christ Jesus through that prayer. So, and finally, we can just talk to God in prayer as a savior, as a brother, and as a friend. And as we pray and see God in action, it builds our faith, which leads me to the fourth thing that people known by God do. They have faith in action. True faith in action results in doing something. The woman at the well, after she realized that Jesus was the Messiah, what'd she do? Did she sit down and ponder about it for a while? No. She ran in John 4, 28 and 29. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? You know how much courage it took for her to do that? She's getting water at that time to avoid people, shunned as she was. James talks about faith and the actions that go along with it. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone will, may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith in action also means being co-laborers with Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We are God's body. And it doesn't have to be anything monumental. We were on a prayer call once talking about the body of Christ, and a person said, well, I don't teach or anything like that. I just mail cards to people. Now, some of you might have been on that, that call. You know how important it is for someone to get a card when someone's feeling down or they're depressed or they're alone? We all have gifts, and those gifts need to be used to serve the Lord in his good pleasure. And that faith in action is what leads us to number five. They have lives with trials and tribulations. You, when you follow Christ, you can expect problems. Have you ever had a conflict doing God's will? Have you ever had a conflict with the laws of man and God's law? Have you ever been co-laboring with God and just had all kinds of problems? The enemy working against you. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And 1 Peter 4.12-14 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you after your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, Keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests on you. Whether it's a trial, tribulation, or a crucible, these things are expected in a Christian's life. 
is usually caused by the devil trying to thwart God's people into doing his work. But God can use these things, the work of the enemy. Have you ever heard of crucibles? There are those things that God uses to smooth the rough edges. He uses it to expose character flaws. He uses it to make us aware of things so that we can change. Is it painful? Yes. Is it necessary? Unfortunately, because if you're going to have a character that's ready for heaven, it's necessary. And I ask myself, why does it have to be like this? You know what? We have to ask that God that one in heaven because I'm not a fan of it either. <laughs> I will say this, though. If your life is smooth sailing and you cannot complain about anything that is trivial, that may be a problem. And I'll tell you why. Because trials and tribulations are so talked about in the Bible, it's hard to miss. We're studying in Ephesians this quarter about Sabbath school, right? And we're reading about the armor of God. If you have no trials or tribulations, you actually don't even need the armor of God. And if you don't need the shield of faith to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one, then that means he views you as no threat in his battle against God. The devil saving those fiery darts for a Christian soldier that will impede his evil doing in this battle to save souls on this earth. Just something to ponder on. I could talk about the wheats and the tares or e even in the church and how persecution occurs to those who wish to stand for God's word, for sola scriptura. But I think Ellen White put it best in Maranatha, page 195. As Christ was hated without cause, so will his people be hated because they are obedient to the commandments of God. If he who was pure, holy, and undefiled, who did good only and only good in our world, was treated as a base criminal and commended, con condemned to death, his disciples must be expected but similar treatment. However faultless may their life be, or their life and blameless their character, if you follow Christ, it's going to happen. It's just that simple. Do you think there's going to be persecutions in the last days? We read about it. If you stand for God's word, if you buckle and take the mark of the beast, no. If you are to overcome the narrow and difficult path that leads to life, one must persevere through the fiery trials that exist here and now and the greater ones to come. Which leads to habit number six. They lead Holy Spirit guided lives. They consult God in everything. Prayerfully, they consult God in their work, in their personal lives, and in ministry. First, we look at God, at God breathed scripture to guide our lives. Prayerful scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16, we all know that one. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We apply that in our lives, right? Next, we can look at um, to ask God directly through prayer, asking in faith and trusting. In James 1, 5, and 6, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And we can see how godly counsel can even come from godly men. In Psalms 37, 30, and 31. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps are do not slip. One must be one to sacrifice their own desires and to want not what I want in life, but what God has in store for me. We are all created with a purpose. For God has a purpose for each one of us. Do I want that purpose or do I want my own? It depends on the day. <laughs> I have noticed in my life, have you ever tried to do something and God blocks it? And you know God's involved because something just so unusual happened. It's like, that's not normal. Or have you actually been trying to go a different direction 
and God opened the door that was previously closed because previously he said, no, you're not doing that. But now he's like, the path is clear and he guides you. I should pray all the time for all these things, do I? No. I'm guessing maybe some people, other people don't either. But God intervenes because God really wants what's best for us in this life. Have you ever looked back in hindsight because it's 2020 and seen what you should have done? God knows what we should do. Just remember, he always takes us in a direction that is best for us here and best for us to be with him in heaven someday as well. So when one has a Holy Spirit-led life, the next obvious thing is to share the joy, peace, and contentment and love that you found in Jesus, which leads us to habit number seven. And that is they talk about eternal life to perishing people. You spread the gospel, right? That's the last commandment. Or the last, the last commission that Jesus had, had given to his disciples. They were not shy to tell somebody about life they have found in Christ. Even if they're not preaching, just observing them, it's obvious that they follow Jesus because of the joy and love that they found is so great it cannot be contained. This is the great commission given by Christ in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We don't have to go to the ends of the earth, though, right? We can go to the end of the block or to the neighbor's house, or even in our own household, if, some, if there are non-believers there, to be an evangelist. And I'll tell you, not everybody's cut out for this. I can stand up here and preach, although it still makes me uncomfortable, but to give a Steps to Christ book to somebody in the parking lot, oh, I'm scared to death. My wife will just walk and go, hey, I got this great book, would you like to read it? And I'm like, I'm not there yet. And that's, you know, we all have our talents. We all have the things that we do. Not all of us are the same. But are you at least in some way showing Christ in your life and the joy that you have? Which brings me back to the motto for Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church, to know Jesus and to make him known. I would say if we took the first steps, six steps, about knowing Jesus, about having a prayerful life, about spending time with God and all these things, do you think we would know him? And I'm guessing a lot of people here do already. You're here in church. That would, this is what we do. And then taking that joy that you found and sharing it with a perishing world. Because there are people who may not ever hear about salvation, and they might not fare so well at the second coming. God has given us the task to work with him. Could Jesus do it himself? Could God do it all? Yes. But he wants us to participate so that he can grow us in him. And so that when you do see somebody come to God, you can feel that joy that he feels. I have felt it a few times, and it is incredible. He wants us to be partakers in that. So... And then we can, as, we, as it said before, be that light on the hill to even the neighborhood and other people around us. So you don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be perfect. We went through a whole lot of things in the list. I'm guessing you do some. I have plenty I don't do. But I'm going to say this. Are you on the right path? That's what really matters. What direction are you heading in? And I can back this up biblically. Let's look at Luke 23, 40 through 43. The thief on the cross. But the other answer, the other thief, or, and rebuking him said, do, not, or do you not even fear God since you are under the sen same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly. In other words, we, we got the punishment we deserve. For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. 
but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying to Jesus, Jesus, or saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Did he go to Bible study? Did he get baptized? But he had a change of heart, and he headed in the right direction. He headed in the direction that God wants him to be. So we see that, and we see how he pulls a 180. It's called repenting. He repented from what he did. He accepted Christ, and he was in. And he dies with that hope in his heart. He's barely completed the justification, right? Because we have justification and sanctification, which is just justification over and over again. We have the opportunity to grow and know more about God as he reveals his mysteries to us in this world. So I have to ask ourselves, are we heading in the right direction? Am I growing in Christ? If I had a friend I hadn't seen in five years, a good friend who knew me well, and I hadn't seen him in five years and I met him tomorrow, would he see me differently from what he knew me five years ago? Or would I be the same guy? Are we growing? That's really the question. And if I don't seem different to him, maybe I have something I need to address. So we're either growing in Jesus or we have plateaued in spiritual stagnation. Or maybe even there's some backsliding towards the world. It's time to take our spiritual temperature and see where we are and where we're going. Let's not be the unprepared, foolish virgins. Whatever your spiritual temperature may be, let's get back on track to the Lord, whether that's coming back or continuing, so that we may be known by God and have that agape love dwelling in us towards him. There's seven, I have the seven habits just as a, yep. All right, so we have the seven habits there again. To spend time with God, to spend time in his word, read the Bible, to spend time in prayer, to have faith in action, to, next one, to have, have lives with trials and tribulations really for God to have a Holy Spirit-guided life and to talk about what God has done for us to people that are perishing in this world. A lot of people say they love God and they love Jesus, but unless you have that agape love, that, that Holy Spirit dwelling in you, it's not the same. And when we have that, we will have an experience in this life like none other. To have that agape love and not human love. And if you can do the next slide. So we have to know him. We have to grow in him. That's Christ. We have to love him with that agape love. And we have to serve him for he is our Lord and Savior. And only if we know God and love him can he truly know and ha have us be known to him. Thank you.